Sam, you know what they say when you're on a boat and it's sinking? Get off. Women and children first. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And that's what we're doing with the podcast today. Women and children first. I have a topic I want to talk to you about. Have you seen this startup that's called Co-Fertility? How do you spell it? Co fertility. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. It could have been co, like you spell it with a K, like in the Asian way. I don't know. Co fertility. All right, I get it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm there. So check this out. Uh, you know a little bit about egg freezing, but uh, I didn't know much. I've never done it, but I do know there's like a growing trend of this. I think basically people are having babies later in life, and um, egg freezing tech has come along, and it's also become more normalized. I think some companies pay you, or will, will pay for your egg freezing. Um, but like, just look at this Google trends chart. So last five years, egg freezing is basically gone from, you know, roughly kind of 30, 40 on the Google trends to like basically 80. And so it is, it is on the rise. And that's just in the past, I don't know, a couple of years, two, three years. I think last year, 20,000 women in the United States chose to freeze their eggs. So still a very small number. So for like the 18 year old men who are listening to this podcast. <laughs> For me, six months ago, what <laughs> yeah. is egg freeze? What do, you, what do you mean? So egg freezing. So I guess, uh, I guess I, I actually don't know the difference in terminology, but I know from experience, there's two ways to do it. One, uh, a woman just freezes her eggs. And then when she's ready, uh, uh, I, don't, yeah, I guess Why does you, it feel like we're having the talk? It's like when a man oh, yeah, and a woman love does. each other <laughs> very much. <laughs> the birds well, and the bees. <laughs> I, was a, I was a participant in this. And so I guess you could, you could freeze just eggs. And then eventually when you like meet a husband or you meet someone who you want to like mix it with, you mix it and they stick it up beside the women. And then like nine months later, hopefully she has a kid. Uh, <laughs> the other way you do it is you freeze embryos, um, which is a process that I went through, which is uh, awesome. But... Every like leading up to doing it, I have to bring my sperm to the doctor uh, like 30 minutes after getting the sperm out of my body. And you just have this <laughs> ultimate look of shame. And right. I remember my <laughs> wife and I have debated what is more embarrassing and shameful, like when a woman has to go to a gynecologist or when a man has to like donate <laughs> sperm. Uh, it's like <laughs> it's, it's like it's when a my ho- son comes out, like I haven't seen him in a little while and he's like a three year old and he just comes out of somewhere and he'll be like, I did a bad thing. It's, yeah. that's, that's you walking into the hospital <laughs> holding a cup of sperm. <laughs> it's a it's a horrible experience, and so uh, yes, I, I so that's what egg freezing well, is. Somehow we made this about the dude side of things, but I think for the women it's a little bit harder. They have to like literally like, take shots and like harvest the egg. It's like a very hard process on your body. Anyways, it's also very expensive. So I think traditional egg freezing one cycle is something like ten thousand dollars. And so there's the startup Co Fertility. What they came out and said was, "Hey." Free egg freezing. How is it free? Right. And it says, um, by the way, they had like this billboard or this ad, which was, it says the best time to freeze your eggs is often when you can least afford it. That's why we're making it free. And I don't know if you ever heard that phrase. (laughs) If it's free, then you are the product. (laughs) Yes. Basically. Wow. The biggest version of this. So what it's doing, what they're doing is they're like, we will freeze your eggs for, for, for free, but we keep half. (laughs) <laughs> we, keep, we keep half the eggs. And this sounds a little crazy when you first hear about it, but I actually think this is pretty smart. What they've done is they bundled together two things. They bundled together egg freezing and egg donation. So some people do donate eggs. They get paid for it and they're willing to do that. They go in eyes wide open and they choose to do that. And that's great because other people need eggs. And so they bundled it together where now you can... You can get free egg freezing if you bundle in and agree to donate half the eggs up front. And on the other side, they go and charge people who want eggs and they charge them $13,000 at $13,700 to as their matchmaking fee to get you your eggs. And so I think this is a pretty smart and disruptive uh, model. What do you think of this idea? Uh, Insane. I think this is insane. Not in a bad way, necessarily. I think it's a bad way for me. I don't want to do that. But... I think that the whole process of that that I went through, that my wife and I went through, I think it was like something like sixty thousand um, dollars, and her insurance paid for it. But if you can't afford it, you're screwed. This is pretty wild. Do you think this could actually work as a business? I think this can totally work. I think there's a lot of people out there who, like you said, they don't have the extra tens of thousands of dollars to freeze their eggs. And so, if if your options were 
don't ha- don't freeze it or this free option but you're going to donate your you know some of your unused eggs and you'll know that they're out there in the world i think there's a lot of people who will take that and i by the way i think that because this is controversial it's going to get so much free press like there is something um almost strategic in doing a a sl- sort of controversial taboo almost a naughty idea and you will get s- article after article, online argument after online argument. And all it really does is it pushes away the people who were never going to be your customer, but it educates the people who actually might be your customer because it's going to be so noisy. Dude, let me tell you a related story. So she said I could name her name, but you and I have a friend named Kat. And well, she's I'm really close with her. I don't know if you're close with her. I think you've just met her once or twice. Um, her and her wife wanted to have a kid. And it was, and although she's successful, she's a, uh, She's a frugal woman, and it was really expensive to do this. And we all have a mutual friend, David, who's this wonderful man. He's like a six foot tall, good looking, nice, smart guy. And Kat and her wife, Emily, were like, David, would you like to, uh, you know, could we get some of your sperm and have a baby? And they looked into like some of this egg freezing stuff, and it was really expensive. And they were like, can we just kind of do it yourself on this one. And so uh, they didn't have sex. They didn't have sex, but he would come over in the morning, uh, like when they were ovulating and he would do the deed in the bathroom. They would get the sperm and they would just kind of, uh, I guess they had like a do it yourself kid at home. Like a <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like a, tur- a turkey baster. <laughs> I don't know. Like, and uh, they did that. And in the very first try, Kat got pregnant. Now she's got a beautiful two year old. And wow. It worked. So what it did worked. he get? Like free lunch? What what happened? What did David get out of this? Nothing. He just he's like a he's like dude. It's like on paper. Dude, this that's how she's a, a great marketer, dude. She is a great <laughs> entrepreneur and a great marketer. She convinced this guy to do this for free. You, you know, she used her uh, her marketing skills. Well, they have a beautiful kid, and he's like the uncle, and his parents sort of act like a mixture of grandparents and uncle and aunts and it's like a wildly awesome relationship and everyone's happy with the ordeal and so this whole like co-fertility thing i think this is another interesting solution to the same problem similar problem what's the what's the slogan for austin uh, i don't know what is it uh, keep, keep austin keep weird Austin weird <laughs> they kept, they you kept guys it are weird. doing your part out there <laughs> <laughs> they kept it weird if i told you this solution like oh it's just possible you'd be like that's crazy these three people, it's I guess it's a thruple. I don't know what you call this. It's perfect. It's like the most <laughs> harmonious relationship I've ever seen. Yeah, it sounds actually very healthy, to be honest. It's um, very healthy. So I like co-fertility. Do they raise money? Um, I, I, You know how I think they raise money? They have the like, you know when you see somebody who goes to the store and buys a new outfit and you're like, you're looking great, but like can't really put your finger on what's new about it. And then you see the tag on their jacket still. You're like, oh. This is, you got a new jacket. That's what you went shopping and got a new jacket. Their fonts are all the fonts of like a red antler brand where you're like, oh, you launched, but you paid for fancy branding up front. You got a font that I can't find on defont.com in the free section. And so I know that they got some money somehow to do this. All right, everyone, a quick break to tell you about HubSpot. And this one's really easy for me to talk about because I'm going to show you a real life example. So I've got this company called Hampton, joinhampton.com. It's a community for founders doing between $2 million all the way up to like $250 million a year in revenue. And one of the ways that we've grown is we've created these cool surveys. And so we have a lot of founders who have high net worths, and we'll ask them all types of questions that people typically are embarrassed to ask, but provide a lot of value. So things like how much the founders pay themselves each month, how much money they're spending each month, what their payroll looks like if they're optimistic about the next year and their business, all these questions that people are afraid to ask, but well, we ask them anyway, and they tell us in this anonymous survey. And so what we do is we created a landing page using HubSpot's landing page tool. And it basically has a landing page that says, here's all the questions we asked. Give us your email if you want to access it. And then I shared this page on Twitter. And we were able to get thousands of people who gave us their email and told us they want this survey. And I could see, did they come from social media? I can see, did they come from Twitter, from LinkedIn, basically everywhere else that they could possibly come from? I'm able to track all of that. And then I'm able to see over the next handful of weeks, how many of those people actually signed up and became a member of Hampton. In other words, I can see how much revenue came from this survey, how much revenue came from each traffic source, things like that. But the best part is I can see how much revenue came from it. And a lot of times it takes a ton of work to make that happen. HubSpot made that super, super easy. 
If you're interested in doing this, you can check it out, hubspot.com. The link's in the description. And I'll also put the link to the survey that I did so you can actually see the landing page and how it works and everything like that. I'm just going to do that call to action then. And it's free. Check it out in the description. All right. Now back to MFM. Uh, this is pretty cool. Would you do this? Yeah, why not? Uh, also, it's hilarious that like on this huge life decision, I was like, why not? And then for the first time in my life, my brain responded with several reasons. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Usually why not is met with nothing. So they did some, uh, I was reading some study and it said that 83% of egg donors share that they would donate again and only 2% regret their decision, which forget about, you know, surveys I think are, are often prone to just like finding data that supports the point you want. But I do think it's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting statistical thing, which is what percentage of people regret X decision? Like, I would love to see a list of life decisions and then the regret score. Um, you know, for example, Tattoos. Burning Man. <laughs> Burning Man is this thing that I've been on the fence for for like 11 years, even though everybody I like and trust in my life who goes is like, it's the best. What are you even talking about? What's the decision? Just go. And I don't know anybody that's regretted it personally in my life. I'm sure there are people because there's like a million people that go every year. But I, I just kind of want to see for life decisions, the, the regret percentage for each thing. I think that would be very illuminating for uh, somebody who's trying to make good decisions in life. Don't you think? Wait, so why haven't you gone? To Burning Man? I'm scared of drugs. Yeah, same. <laughs> but you just literally said no one that you've met has regretted it. And when I tell them that, they're like, so then don't do drugs. I'm like, but I thought that's what you do there. And they're like, no, that's just one of many things. You don't have to do drugs. My Why, what kind of dork ass response was that? And then I'm like, okay, I'll I'll think about it this year. Then I go home and I'm like, I'm still scared of drugs. I'm not doing this. My square friend, like my I'm straight edge. So my other straight edge friend and his girlfriend, they're like, hey, we went to Burning Man. Burning Man, it was awesome. You guys want to see some pictures? I mean, I was looking at pictures and swiping their phone, and it, it looked a little bit normal, a little bit normal. And he's like sitting over my shoulder like yeah this is this cool guy we've met like here's this cool <laughs> van that we saw um there's us just like doing this and then <laughs> there's a picture of him butt naked like <laughs> with a, a full frontal photo with his arm over her who's also naked and they're just like smiling and then he's just like yeah there we were like celebrating <laughs> this thing <laughs> the weather was great that day yeah, and then just swipe, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I saw that, and I was like, I don't know, man. Burning Dude, those man, might be uh, the scariest words in the English language. Do you want to see some pictures from my Burning Man trip? <laughs> it's like, you know, right before you go to Six Flags, and they put the the, the, the like roller coaster thing, and the thing comes down and clamps you in. That's, that's how I feel when somebody says, you want to see the pictures from Burning Man this year. Um, I want to do another parenting one. Before I get right. to the parenting one, can I do a quick little thrill the shill? Thrill me, baby. This is something I'm um, I'm proud of. So in Hampton, we have access to like a thousand founders, and we've been doing these really cool surveys where we What's survey. Hampton, by the way, Hampton. It's my community uh, for CEOs, uh, average CEOs doing about twenty five million dollars in revenue. You guys can check it out and you apply. We interview everyone. Fun fact: my partner Joe and I watch one hundred percent of the interviews, and we're the ones clicking the approve or deny button. Um, so You're like the Harvey Weinstein of the of the process, <laughs> would you say? <laughs> No, I would not <laughs> say that. <laughs> I would not. So check it out, joinhampton.com. But here's what's kind of cool. We did this survey and I was like, let's do wealth, where we like ask all these people all these questions like, you know, how much money do you have? What's your monthly burn? All these questions that people are embarrassing to have. It was cool. But then we were like, let's actually do it by industry. And so we're doing it by software. Uh, we're doing it by all the different industries. So what other industries are there? Software, marketplaces, health stuff. Uh, we just did one on e-commerce. And if you go to joinhampton.com, or just search, just actually, this is easier. Look in the YouTube description or just Google Join Hampton and then blog and you'll see our blog and you'll see all of our reports. Dude, we did this thing with e-com owners where we asked them all about their revenue per employee and uh, their uh, how much profit they're making, how much they're paying themselves, things like that. Did you see that thing we released? What was the revenue per employee? I'm curious. Dude, it was pretty good. So let me read you off oh, some of the. Wow, what a satisfying answer! Thanks. Thanks I'm man. gonna read it. I'm gonna. <laughs> this, the chart just says pretty good. <laughs> yeah, decent. It just says decent. I'm gonna read. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll read you uh, off. So we had about 50 people reply. The average revenue of the responder was 25 million. Average revenue per employee 1.35 million. The average founder paid themselves 385 thousand dollars a year. Net profit has grown consistently over the last couple of years, and we break down each company's net profit. Um, and shockingly, I guess this isn't shocking to you and I, fucking Meta 
dude. It's still the best platform for buying ads for oh, yeah. e-com. Dude, uh, it is, except for there's a couple of people just dominating on TikTok shops right now. But um, let me ask you something. On 1.3 million of revenue per employee, so, right? So 1.3 million of revenue per employee, I would say that a good e-commerce brand is doing 20% profit margins on that before taxes, EBITDA, EBITDA margin. Um, and I would say the average might be between 10 and 15%. So let's just do a little math. So 1.3... And let's just use the 15% number. What is that? $195,000. And so I would guess the average wage might be 100 for these e commerce uh, stores, maybe 120. And so roughly 50 to 70K of profit per employee. And so that's why the 30th and final slide of this presentation, where we go through all the numbers, it just, it just e says e commerce sucks. It just says <laughs> don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. Don't. <laughs> but if you're listening and you are into e-commerce, check it out. Just look up, uh, you can go to joinhampton.com slash blog or just search Hampton blog and you'll see all the reports there or in the YouTube description. Now, can we talk about something that it was your idea to cover this person and yep. I'm now obsessed with them? Who's hmm. that person? Dr. Becky. <laughs> Dr. Becky. I love Dr. Becky. I more so love the idea of her than maybe I actually well, love her. Explain what you, who she is and why you love her. I'm going to give you like the two-minute breakdown of who she is. So Dr. Becky, I believe her real name is Becky Prince. Now her name is Becky Kennedy. Grew up in Scarsdale, New York, which is like a really nice suburb in Long Island. On Long Island, it's like 45 minutes outside the city. She had a bunch of issues as a kid. So she had like emotional issues that she wasn't sure how to handle. Uh, eventually, that developed into anorexia, and she starts going to therapy at age eight or nine, gets obsessed with therapy, goes to Duke and Columbia to study psychology. And then starting around the pandemic, so 2020, she just starts doing this content on Instagram. And it, I looked at her first post. It feels like very impromptu. So it's like her just kind of like actually like this setting or like you, your setting behind, next to a wall, just with her camera up and answering questions about parenting, of which she studied uh, at Duke and Columbia. And it takes off. And one of the reasons it takes off is she's very charismatic. She's very cool looking. She's got the it factor. She looks like someone who you could trust and she grabs your attention nicely. Although it's sort of like Andrew Huberman, where he's not doing anything like thrilling, but there's something about their personality and the way they look where you're like, I just want to trust and listen. I trust. You just trust this person. Yeah, I just want to listen to you. Now, things kind of take off and she's like, let's turn this into a thing. So she creates this business called Good Inside. And it's a community where you pay $300 a year and you, uh, you get access to like this area where you can talk to other members and you could ask questions. And they also have a bunch of, uh, she calls it good inside clinicians, but people who I guess who she's trained who are talking and answering different questions. And now it's a thriving community. Behind the community, you also can see videos of her, things like that. And by the way, do you know who she partnered with to start this business? I do. I just found that out right before this pod. I was you, like, did you catch that? I was like, Erica Belsky. Huh. Is that a common last name? Or is this Scott Belsky's wife? And it turns out it's Scott Belsky's wife. No way. It's Scott Belsky's wife. Friend of the pod, Scott Belsky. Yes, yeah, Scott Belsky, who's now the chief product officer at uh, Adobe. Uh, I don't know if he's actually been on the pod, but we both admire him. Just a wildly successful, cool dude. And that's her partner. And did you also know that they've recently raised $10 million for this business, Good Inside. No way. I did not know that. And this is only like a few years old. I think it's like three or four years old. But you, you missed the headline. The headline of the story is uh, the product, uh, this, their product, Good Inside, has about 50,000 paying members. So their membership community is probably doing around 13, 14 million a year in revenue, giving parents parenting tips, parenting advice from two clinical physicians and mothers, right? Uh, that's kind of amazing. And this is that's a, amazing. it's an interesting market. There's actually a bunch of these. So I don't know if you ever saw, uh, taking care of babies. Do you, do you know who that is? No. What's that one? So if you just get her, her, her name is Kara and then her handle is taking care of babies. We had bought her course like for a hundred something bucks when I had my first kid and she has basically like a sleep training course. Of oh, like tra yes, train your baby I, to yeah. sleep without, without, uh, crying it out. I did so this I too. Her, I bought a hundred dollar course. I sat down. I did it. I looked at it. I watched it, and I was like, "Yeah, we're not going to be able to do that." But either way, it was good material, and there was some good insights in it. And basically, the funnel for these is all the same: free content on Instagram or YouTube, and then basically, like they're just building trust on Instagram. Really, where it's like 
here's who I am. Here's what I do. I'm going to put up stories and tips every single day. They build up trust, 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 trust. And then they have the free, or sorry, they have the paid either membership or educational product underneath it, the info product. Taking care of babies was making somewhere between 10 and $15 million. This was not even like a company. This is just like her. Uh, 10 to $15 million a year in revenue with fat profit margins because she was spending nothing on marketing and basically had no, you know, a small team or no team. And, uh, and then she got canceled. <laughs> Unfortunately, she got canceled because she donated to Trump, of all things. Like, a pretty crazy reason to cancel somebody, but uh, the mom sort of in mass unsubscribed. And in all the mommy groups on Facebook, they were like, we're not going to support her if she's going to support Trump. And so she kind of got knocked down a couple of pegs. I think she's still out there doing fine. But, but wouldn't know, like the Trump people be like, yeah, I'm in even harder? Well, I think there's probably some lean in the like who uses these products and who pays for these products, which is like maybe more coastal moms and whatnot. Like it might be skewed in that way. Um, I'm not sure, but but you're right. Yeah, it, it it doesn't fully doesn't fully make sense. But I remember reading that. There's other ones. Uh, ben had bought this one called Big Little Feelings. I think uh, they sold two hundred thousand courses at an average of a hundred dollars, so twenty million in revenue. Um, turns out, mom influencer, great career. <laughs> great career if you could pull it off. And it's a very simple career. Uh, not easy to do. Let me put that put it that way. But very simple. Free content on Instagram lead to paid thing. But obviously, these people have expertise. Maybe they've been a, a doula for a long time, or they're a clinical physician, or they're a clinical psychologist, sorry. Um, they, ha they have to have some you know, expertise or authority in the domain. But you know, one of the things I really liked about Dr. Becky's content, by the way, is I think intentionally, she makes it relatable. So she's not wearing a lot of makeup. She's not sitting in front of a very well-produced thing, which of course they could afford it at this point, but she'll be like on the go to pick up her kids from soccer practice, just take out her phone when she has the impulse about some topic and say it. And I think it makes her feel like the kind of relatable but aspirational mom who like just finds time, doesn't have time type of thing. And um, I think there's something strategic about that, that. That's pretty cool. So that's what I wanted to bring up. So... Dr. Becky is, I think, a very, very smart woman. And I think she runs with very smart people. Because I was looking into this woman a little bit, and this sounds like I'm hating. I don't mean for it to sound that way. I'm a big fan of this person, and I think they're the real deal. I think that this is far more put together than it appears to be. It tries to look like it's kind of thrown together, and, and it's this thing. But... Dr. Becky lives on the Upper West Side of New York, where a 1,800 square foot apartment is typically five to like seven million dollars. And she also like uh, went to the best schools. She's from Scarsdale, which is a beautiful, uh, fancy community uh, in New York. I think that she runs around with you know people like Erica Belsky, these people that are top notch, top at their game. And they, I think that it was definitely like a we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this, not. Oh, what thing just happened to turn to this, to this, to this? <laughs> like, she's executing this plan perfectly. And so, right. this again, this sounds like I'm being negative. I'm, I'm not. I, there's nothing wrong or unethical at all about any of this. Uh, but it, like, I think this is like a perfectly executed plan is what I think it is. Yeah, I think for most content creators, it starts organically, right? Because you don't sit there and think, and now from scratch, I shall become an influencer with millions of followers. It's not really I think how she most did. start. I don't I think, think so, she dude. did. I don't think so. Dude, I, we can scroll if back. I could, like, let's scroll all the no, way. No, they back deleted here. old posts. All the old. I already found the old posts. They've been <laughs> like, I, 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 or I looked on on YouTube. Like, there, like, there aren't that many old posts. Um, and here's what I think. I think that if had you met this woman ten years ago, like, it would have been very. You could have just had a conversation with her and been like, Yeah, I, I think you got the it factor. Like, this is like a type of person who I see her talking. I'm like, dude, it's very obvious that you've got like whatever these popular influencers right. have. Let's just put a little bit of money behind this and turn this into a thing. Well, I like that you've gone CoffeeZilla on this one. You're like, hey, wait, pa pause that frame. That's Oprah <laughs> in the background. She's friends with Oprah. <laughs> You're like, if I try to find the thing, I think my, my personal belief, I don't think it's plotted, but I do think it's strategic. Meaning, I think there is a lot of, uh, to make something look effortless, to make something look authentic and, 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 and real, it actually takes some effort to make something look effortless. And it takes um, some thinking to make something look off the cuff in a way, right? And um, and often it's not that you're manipulating people, but it's you're intentionally saying no to certain things that would ruin that vibe, that would break that trust, that would break the fourth wall or whatever. And so I do think that they've done a, a great job of that. It's like, uh, you know, there, but there is the negative version. Like I think, remember those stories about Sam Bankman-Fried where they were like, um, 
hey, uh, you know, you're going to meet with whoever, this investor today. And they're in the boardroom and they're like, Sam, um, you look good. And he's like, thanks. And they're like, no, like you need to, you need to look like a, like you need to look like a dork. And they were like, get this man some jorts and uh, like somebody ruffle up his hair, make it look like he hasn't slept in six weeks. And there was a, there was an article that basically was like, we basically knew that people pattern match. And if we can look basically like Zuckerberg and a bunch of the other like kind of prodigies who are awkward, who dr- don't know how to dress, who uh, they have these weird personality quirks. Okay, let's play up that he's vegan. Let's make him drive this car, right? Like there was intentional choices along the way to either make him look more like that or prevent anybody from polishing up those rough edges. They're like, no, 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 the rough edges are key. Let's keep those and actually let's put those front and center. Yeah. And um, there was there were stories that came out. It's very rare for those stories to come out because even the people that pull it off, they they never have any incentive to come out and like acknowledge that. It's only when somebody has a complete downfall that his closest confidants come and betray and be like, yeah, that actually happened. By the way, I am not remotely implying yeah. that Sam Bankman Freed <laughs> and this woman are even in the same. I'm not all I'm saying. I like this lady. I trust her advice. I think you she's are not wonderful. getting an invite to her Hamptons <laughs> party this summer. All right. What I'm saying is I think that she's just a shark when it comes to business, which is not something that would you would necessarily want to portray when you're trying to be a a mother expert. I'm on board with Becky. I think she's the best. So I, I'm on board. Um, what? Uh, is there any niches that you think are interesting other than parenting for this model? Because this model is the most basic, simple model. Explain the model. What, what do you mean by that? So the model is, um, well, I don't know why they raise money for this because typically you don't need to with this model. But the model is, we'll use Andrew Huberman as an example. So, Or we could use what I've done, whatever. But the model is you get popular on the internet and become a thought expert. And then you get popular oftentimes through having a blog, sometimes a podcast, sometimes on social media. And then you create a community. You create a community that is uh, something like two or $300 a year. And you try to get as many people as possible. And then you also host events that cost money. And then you have courses that are between $1,000 and $2,000, something to upsell because you want your pricing to be something cheap a little bit more expensive and a little bit more expensive. And then you just focus on getting more and more popular and creating this business all around a lifestyle and idea for her. Her idea is, um, uh, what's it called? Good inside. I think that's like her, it's like, that's like a thing she teaches called good inside for other people. Like, um, there's Mark Sisson who did this with, um, uh, good Apple, which is about like a, a health company. There's a lot of people who have done this in a variety of niches where it's thought leader, blog, book, course, community, and then like some type of higher tiered membership. Yeah, definitely. I, like Miss Excel did this with just teaching people Excel. Excel expert, create free content, leads to courses, leads to info products, leads to membership. Uh, I think this playbook has been out for a while. And by that, I just mean to say, I don't think this is, um, I don't think you have to do the figuring out. All you have to do is the execution, which is nice in a way. But it also means it's kind of competitive. It's not as easy as it might have been if you were early in the figuring out phase. But you could definitely do it. We've done it in a way. Um, we just gave three examples in the parenting niche that have done it. Miss Excel has done it there. There's people who have done it in the you know the V shred type of model that have done it in the guys bodybuilding. What's V shred? V shred? You know you don't know what V shred is? Uh, no. What is that involve like the V of your abs? Uh, yes, yes, the Dorito body, baby. You want your you want your upper body to be shaped like an upside down Dorito. Um, you don't know who V Shred is? That blows my mind, dude. Let's V Shred. It is the perfect intersection of dudes shirtless, successful businesses, and internet affiliate marketers. I can't believe you don't know who this guy is. That is your that's your Venn diagram. Sign me up. <laughs> you don't know who V Shred is? Oh my god! All right, so let me give you a little V Shred. Uh, Story. So th- you you do know this guy. As soon as I, you see him, you're going to know this guy. I I'm on his website. I have I I don't I've never seen this before in my life. Basically, this guy was super jacked guy who then has runs Facebook ads. You click the Facebook ad and it takes you down a funnel. And his funnels are pretty like well known in the internet like marketing niche because it'd be like a V shred click funnel, and it would be uh, usually a quiz and it would take you through a quiz of like uh, I'm a guy. It's like do you want to get jacked? Or get abs. And you're like, oh, man. Or it's like both. It's like, give me both. And then it'd be like, <laughs> what holds you back? Is it, you know, 
eating poorly? You're like, yeah, it is eating poorly. How'd you know? And then you just keep going down this funnel. It's like, I'm going to give you a personalized thing. And then it gives you a personalized thing and you pay 99 bucks for it. And he basically ran this funnel um, and made like, I don't know how much money this guy made, but I'm pretty sure I read at one point, this was like nine figures, but I think I might be mixing up Kino Body and V-Shred. No, now. you're right. I'm looking at V-Shred and some, like there's some stories saying it's done $200 million in revenue. Yeah. So how, look at this blog post, how V-Shred use a quiz funnel to drive 200 million in revenue. I don't know if this is like legit or not, but in 20, 2022, they had 5 million monthly visitors on their website. And wow. uh, yeah, this guy just basically dominated with, uh, with Facebook ads for the, the health and fitness niche. Now, what he was doing was he was using ads. He was still an influencer, but he was like, cool, I'm going to pump ads. And I have this like funnel that was basically the most simple click funnel in the world. Like you go there, literally, we could show this on the screen. It's a progress bar. And then it just says, are you a man or a woman? And it was like simple, like A or B type of answers. And you click, you click, you click. And then you kind of want to see what's the end here. And then they'll show you like at the end, it's like before he sells you the thing, he shows you like five transformations. Like here's this nerd. Now he's jacked. Here's this fat guy. Now he's skinny. And it just shows you like five transformations. And then it's like, do you want that shit or not? And then you buy it. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Imagine the, them just describing it at their meeting like you did. So we're going to show them a, <laughs> a nerd, a fat guy. And then we're just going to say, want this shit or not? <laughs> so like, where are we going to get a nerd? Take your shirt off right now. Go and take a picture. It's you. You're the guy. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about this guy, Isaac? Yeah, yeah. Tell the story. Okay. This is like a full, this is a full circle story. So have you, have you seen... Have you seen what the guy, that guy Isaac's doing? The guy who we talked about his mini katana brand. What's his last um, name? I have no idea what Isaac's last name is. Isaac, mini katana guy, sword guy. And we talked about him before because he had taken a, a product that was super niche, literally katanas, like, like I don't know, Japanese sword swords. Or it is. Yeah, he swords. sent me one. Yeah, they're called mini katanas, by the way. This thing is like six feet long. It's, yeah, so it's long. not mini. N- nothing mini about it. You know how pissed my wife was? And we got this like giant sword in the house now. And I'm like, I don't know. It's supposed to be small. I, I don't know what happened. Um, and they couldn't run Facebook ads or Google ads because you can't advertise weapons. And so what he did was really smart was he basically got content creators to make cool video. He, he turned his disadvantage to his advantage. His disadvantage was I can't run ads. His advantage was I sell a cool product, swords. And there's a lot of cool content you can make with swords. And he just used YouTube and TikTok to go viral many times. And he built it up to like 10 million or so a year, it, basically like, you know, uh, 10, 10 to 20 million a year in revenue on the Katana brand. But of course, surprise, surprise, there's not a lot of repeat purchase in the sword niche, right? Like you're not, you know, there are some collectors, but for most people, most people don't want a sword. Of the people who want a sword, you might just want one. You might not want to fill your house with swords. So it was not a great e com product. But what's he well, doing now? He switched hold on. Now. Before you get to what he's doing now, You've missed a few points about Isaac. So Isaac, I listened to a podcast with him. He was like, uh, he did Postmates and like freelancing and things like that. And then he's like, I'm going to start a business. And so he was like, yeah, we can't, like you said, we can't advertise. But you didn't say how big his channels got. So basically, he was like, I'm going hard on content. And so he gets 1 billion views a month across his network of, of YouTube channels. And so his main channel on YouTube, which only launched in 2022, has 8.7 million subscribers and five uh, oh, like, and billions of views. And this is like not their main product. Their main product is the swords, and they're just using this as marketing. But it's they knocked it out the park. It's, it's an incredible example of marketing. I've used this. Uh, I've I've used. I've learned some things from Isaac and used them in my business um, that have been very effective. And it's a, just a different way of thinking about marketing. So, but what he was doing was he would say, "All right, how do you sell a mini katana? You can either go to people who." already are collectors. That's a really, really small market. You go to people who might be interested. Why? Because they have interest in anime and, and different like interest overlaps. Where do they hang out? Okay, they hang out on TikTok and on YouTube. All right, cool. How do I actually get them to want my product? How do I build desire for my product? And what he did was instead of saying, here's the sword, here's the features, here's how the handle looks, here's how sharp it is, whatever. He's like, do you think I can cut this bullet in half? If I shot a bullet at somebody at this ninja... Do you think the ninja could cut it in half with a sword? <laughs> and that video has like, I don't know, 10, 20 million views. It's like an insane video where a guy literally chops a bullet in half as it's flying at him using a sword. And um, then he does another one where it's like, which is kind of like a weird, that's like a weird thing. That's like saying like, if you punch me, me saying like, told you my face could stop that. 
Like, <laughs> like <laughs> the bullet aims at the sword. <laughs> Hurt your hand, huh? Yeah. <laughs> as, as you bleed. Um, he also did one that was like another marketing thing I really liked of his was how do you not mention the product in a way that drives the comments crazy? So he started a video that was, or not he, but like one of his creators started a video that was like, they're like cooking a steak. So you think it's a cooking video and it's about a steak. And then they put the steak on the, on the cutting board. And then they take a giant katana and they cut it into slices, but they never mentioned the katana. And every comment was like, uh, are we going to talk about him using a actual <laughs> sword to cut the steak? What, what the hell was that? And the comments drive the virality. And it was, if he had said, now watch me use this sword, people wouldn't care. It's when he didn't mention the sword that all the comments have to talk about, uh, bro, can we, what, what is this? <laughs> and it's that type of social engineering that I think was really, really smart. All he needed was a better product. I think he might have a better product now. And so he he starts to sit down and he's like, all right, so my business got to like 10 or 20 million in revenue. That's not enough. I want to go to 1 billion. And so he shared out, he goes, in late 2022, I stepped back and I said, I need to hit a billion dollar company or I want to make a billion dollar company. Here's my five requirements. Would the content playbook give us an, a severe unfair advantage? Does, the, does it have a huge TAM? Meaning could a 1% win be a massive outcome? Is, there some, is this something that I'm personally passionate about? Does this have a moat, sort of like Mini Katana Store already had, which is like making swords are really hard. So if I can figure that out, I have a moat. And then finally, the product doesn't 100% rely on marketing because I want tailwinds. Uh, I, want, I want to like catch a wave. And so he said, what can I launch that fits that? And so what did he launch? He launched a freeze-dried candy brand called Kanpai Foods. And um, it's basically a candy brand. And it's, I, I don't know, have you ever had freeze dried candy? I, I've never tried this. I, I don't think I've had this. I don't really know what it is. All right. So here's what it says freeze dried process removes all moisture from the candy, leaving behind a perfectly crunchy treat. So I think it's candy that's crunchy like a chip, basically. And light. So it's like a gummy bear, but it's like a puff. light. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, it's like just the sugar. <laughs> and so he, uh, by the way, this is a great example of one of the most, Valuable insights that I ever had on the podcast. When Alex Hermosi came on the podcast a long time ago, I don't know where this was. His first came on like three years ago. And, you know, Hormozy puts out like, you know, a metric shit ton of content every month. And I don't consume all of it. But this one thing he said to me three years ago on our podcast has stuck with me. And I've repeated it to myself and many others. I actually told Isaac this at a party once when I was talking about, dude, you are doing 10 out of 10 execution on a two out of 10 opportunity. This was the advice I needed to hear early in my career because I started a restaurant and I tried to do all the coolest shit in the world and I tried my hardest and I was trying to bring 10 out of 10 effort and I thought I was a 10 out of 10 talent, but I was going after a two out of 10 opportunity. And that's what Hormozzi said that he, that, that's the advice he got from Russell Brunson about his gym launch thing. They were like, uh, dude, you're, you're an amazing marketer, but you're just using your marketing to launch brick and mortar gym chains one at a time, a couple in a year maybe. What you need to do, that's you taking 10 out of 10 execution at a 2 out of 10 opportunity, brick and mortar, small scale boutique gyms. Instead, what you should do is take your marketing playbook and go sell it to every gym across the country. That's the 10 out of 10 opportunity. Similarly, um, you know, uh, just the last segment we talked about with the Dr. Becky, taking her, her expertise in children, if all she did was saw five, five clients a day as a clinical child psychologist or whatever it is, um, that would be a smaller opportunity than what she decided to do, which was make a media product that scaled to millions of people and then charge you know a membership fee and make thirteen to fifteen million a year on her membership fees, right? That's a same skill set, bigger opportunity or same person, bigger opportunity. I think what Isaac's done is he's taken that ten out of ten content playbook that he really like mastered, and he switched from going to a, a one, I would actually give the sword thing like honestly, a one or two out of ten opportunity. And now he's going for like, you know, a sort of a five or six out of 10, maybe six out of six or seven out of 10 opportunity because he said it right. He might have had 100% of the mini katana market before, and it'll be smaller than him getting half a percent of the, uh, of the candy market or even the like alternative candy market in this case. What did you do with your mini katana? 
It's sitting right over there on the wall in my office. <laughs> in a case. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> which is the problem with it, which is the exact problem with that business. Is mine's doing the same thing. It's just sitting there and I showed it to three people. Oh, what one am I time. supposed to practice every day? What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so did he shut down Mini Katana? I have no idea, but he should. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just light it on fire and throw it in the dumpster and hope no one finds it with that whole business. It's honestly an underrated uh an underrated thing is the art of quitting. Um like your whole life you're told not to quit and you're told that perseverance is everything. Well, quitting like everything, it, it wouldn't exist if it didn't have a function. And uh there is a function to quitting things. And you know, it's easy to quit when everything's failing. The hard thing to quit is the slow burn of mediocrity, right? Like the thing that's not taking up all your attention, but it's taking up some. The thing that's not totally working and achieving your goals, but it's not totally failing. It's that middle zone is the danger zone. Um, the things that are obviously failing are easy to stop. We stop them, no problem. The things that are working are easy to keep working. You just shouldn't stop them. It's the things in that middle zone that people are very, very bad at quitting. And if I had to give myself a little pat on the back, this is the one thing I'm good at is being pretty ruthless about things in the middle zone. Like I had a venture fund that I was doing. I, I had a rolling fund. It paid me very well. And I was deploying, I don't know, close to $10 million a year to invest in startups. It was, uh, it was good, but it was in the middle. I found better investment opportunities outside of that, um, but it wasn't so bad that I needed to stop, and I could have just let it chug along and eat away at my focus and instead just made a ruthless cut and said, I'm stopping this. And when are you stopping it? I'm stopping it yesterday. It's done. Now I'm, I'm just going to stop it now. That was a good time to use a, a line that I, I think we should make our line, which is not to toot my own horn, but beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta say it like that dude that was so good. have you said that before Where did that come from? is that from something that's an mfm special dude once in a while you just get me like you make me laugh in a way that very few people can make me laugh dude it is so funny that is, oh my god wow just give yourself a little toot <laughs> To do my own arm, but beep me. <laughs> oh, that was good. I don't want to do the podcast anymore. I want to end it and laugh. That's uh, an MFM special. Um, Isaac, I think you're awesome, man. Sean, I think you're awesome for being a quitter. Beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Becky, even though I was sounded like I was being rude, I think you're also awesome. Beep, beep. Um, <laughs> is that it? Is that the pod? That's it. That's the pod. <laughs>